today we're going to talk about the factors that affect the levels of uh, fertility and the uh, factors that affect mortality. Let's, let's first start with fertility. So um, a couple terms that you will need to know as we go through this. Crude birth rate. Now the crude birth rate is the birth rate that applies to an entire population not taking age or gender into account. So this is basically taking the entire population and basically saying, here's what the birth rate is. Now, for example, in 2010, Niger was highest in the crude birth rate with 52 births out of 1,000 people, while Monaco was the lowest with seven births out of 1,000 people. So um, it's really a crude, crude way to do it in this ratio way. Most of the time, we use either the total fertility rate or the fertility rate in order to decide and to figure out the birth rate of a country or of a population. So the fertility rate is the number of lives, live births, pardon me, live births per 1,000 women aged 15 to 49 years in a given year. That would be the fertility rate. And again, it can go up and down. The total fertility rate, and this one's a long one, is the average number of children that would be born alive to a woman during her lifetime if she were to pass through her childbearing years conforming to the age specific fertility rates of a given year so remember the total fertility rate is basically the number of children a woman could have in her lifetime as long as she was in the range of 15 to 49 so more than more often than not, we use the fertility rate in order to uh, decide exactly um, the population rate of a country. Now remember, fertility does not necessarily mean that a woman can or cannot conceive. It just means fertility is, is another term for birth rate. Now we're going to talk about four factors that actually affect the levels of fertility in a population. The first one is the demographic factors. Now, for example, where infant mortality is high, families usually have many children in order to compensate for um, expected deaths. So in a place like the United States, our infant mortality rate is pretty low. More often than not, you're going to see smaller families. Then let's say um, some places in Africa, if you take a look at this, we usually have a larger family because birth rates our infant mortality rates are much higher in that particular area. So uh, they, they try to make up for that. Another factor is a, social, uh, a, soci a sociocultural, basically, or social and cultural factors. So for example, tradition in this particular region may demand higher number of children. So um, if tradition demands it, then you're going to have a large number of children. Typically, the higher the education level of the woman usually leads to lower fertility rates. And this goes to um, advances in birth control and contraception. Usually, the higher educated women tend to use birth control or contraception. Religious affiliation might play a role in determining how many children you have. Um, some religions, uh, kind of like tradition, they almost demand that you have many children. A lot of times, also, religious affiliations don't uh, agree with the use of contraception. So that could be an issue uh, or a factor in that particular thing. And income level as well. So if you will have a high income level, you might have more children. Or you might have more children if your income level is lower in order for more people in your family to work. So all these factors kind of determine the level of fertility. Also, economic factors. This kind of ties in back with that income level. We see larger families in LEDCs partly because larger families are an asset because all the people can work, all the children can work, so more work can be produced or more crops or whatever they do. And it's seen as a support for aging parents. Now in MEDCs, we typically see smaller families because of the high costs of raising children. So you don't see a lot of larger families because it is very expensive in MEDCs to raise children. A fourth factor is a political factor. There have been attempts by governments in order to control populations for strategic or possibly economic reasons. So right now in China, 
because of um, <laughs> because of economic reasons, because of the large population that's already booming in China, they have a one-child policy. Um, although that's kind of lacking. Germany in World War II, they wanted a lot of people, um, or a lot of people in their families. Um, as governments were going through because they wanted to see that as a strategic move the larger the population the bigger the government can be you know bigger the stronger the country can be now uh, there are also intermediate variables that you'll need to go into your textbook for now intermediate variables range and uh, they will be discussed however page 91 in your textbook has that information. I left it blank for you just so you can fill it in. So on page 91 in your textbook, use figure 1.8 to fill in those intermediate variables into your notes. Pause the video now so you can do that. Now we also see fertility decline worldwide. Now there's been a slowdown in population growth due to declining fertility levels in most parts of the world. Now, this can be an issue, or it might not be an issue. It depends on the carrying capacity of that particular place. Now, a term you'll see often is something called replacement level fertility. Now, this is a fertility rate of 2.1 children per woman, and this will basically replace you, it replaces the population that's currently here. Now, in 2010, there are 87 countries that are at or below replacement level. The United States is actually one of them. Less children in family do allow women to work and more children to be educated. So if you see in the United States, we do have a higher number of women working, we have a higher number of children educated than we might in an area like Africa where there are um, more women out of work because typically they do not work and higher children um, not being educated or they might be educated only to a certain age. Let's take a look at the factors affecting mortality. And once again, here's a couple definitions for you. The crude death rate, kind of like the crude birth rate, is just a generalized measure of mortality, and it really is heavily influenced by an age structure of the population. So it's a generalized measure. It's not exact. So it's just sort of, okay, these people are older. Based on their birth rate, their infant mortality rates, this is what we think the death rate is going to be. Infant mortality rate is the death of a child less than one year of age. Once they hit one to five, it's actually called childhood mortality rate. Anything over five is part of the normal, uh, the more normal, morta normal mortality rate. You also see the term life expectancy, and this is the average age at which a person is expected to live. Now, in uh, America, it's 73, I believe, or in the United States, in other places in Africa, it's in the 50s. So it depends upon um, several factors why the life expectancy might be different from place to place. And these are some of the reasons why um, some of the factors that affect the mortality. So we might see higher levels of life expectancy in MEDCs than we do in LEDCs. So in LEDCs, we see a lot more, uh, a couple different factors than we would in MEDCs. For example, so in our LEDCs, a higher rate of infectious and parasitic diseases cause mortality rates to be high. We also have see higher levels of poverty, poor access to health care, and overcrowded and unsanitary living conditions. Whereas in MEDCs, our highest rate of death is actually cancers and heart disease, uh, we also see occupation as part of um, um, the factors in age structure. Usually the, the older you are, we have a, a large population of elderly, I guess above 65, and usually the older you are, you tend to die, of course. And so the age structure is a little bit different as well. So that's one of the factors as well, just old age. Now, Infant mortality is the most sensitive indicator of socioeconomic progress because this is influenced by the improvements in the quality of life, such as water supply improvements, 
better nutrition, improved health care. So if you have a very low infant mortality rate, chances are you have better water, you have better nutrition, and you have a good health care system. So these are some of the things that are very, very much an indicator of socioeconomic progress. Now, life expectancies between MEDCs and LEDCs actually have been converging. They've been coming closer together, even though the wealth gap is widening. So between the MEDCs and LEDCs, we see a large wealth gap. A lot of money, much more money, is are in the MEDC countries than we do in the LEDC countries. This is just a chart showing you some of the life expectancies of um, of some of the countries around the globe. So notice Japan has a life expectancy of 82, Iceland 81, Sweden 81. Uh, look at all the 80s. Notice the United States does not fall into this category. We are in the 70s somewhere. But if you take a look at the lowest life expectancies, notice Botswana, um, that's the lowest with 35 years. I would not be alive <laughs> if I was living in Botswana. Um, Swaziland, Zambia, we have a bunch of, uh, lots of places in Africa have a low expectancy, and you can, or low life expectancy. You can probably go back to some of these um, factors here with the infectious diseases, parasitic diseases, AIDS and HIV in Africa hit a really large number of people and that's really unfortunately um, lowering that life expectancy of um, that particular country.